hello. This is episode three of the Full Metal Beavers Patreon podcast. I'm here joined with Satuna. Say hi, Satuna. Hi, I'm Satuna. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Great energy. Um, Satuna, do you just want to talk about like uh, just a brief bio of who you are, what you're doing, your like your age, grade level, status on the team, etc. Um, hi guys, I'm Satuna. I joined the team in 2018. Currently, I'm a training coordinator. I'm a senior in Jamaica Gateway to the Sciences, and I am going to Lafayette College as a Posse Scholar. All nice. thanks to the team. Nice, Thank nice. You. So talk about um let's talk about your history on the team, like when you joined, and then mm-hmm. we'll take it from there. Well, <laughs> after I let me let's just say one word I can use to describe my history is exponential, whether that's growth or um a fall. So like when I joined, you know, (laughs) when I joined, I started off in the recruitment division as the evaluations coordinator and, and quickly in like two weeks, I became a manager because my manager was like, not doing much. So that was just really new to me. And that was like, I think my first ever leadership experience. And it meant so much. And after that, you know, the school year ended and then I became the apprentice and that role is just way too precious for me. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it was, it was like, can you talk thing. about, can you talk about what the apprentice role is? Cause it's like so coveted on the team, but they're really just crazy people after it. <laughs> Well, the apprentice role, you know, everyone thinks it's all that and it is all that. But, you know, like it's like more like having Dr. French having someone they can trust. So he would tell me to do certain things that the entire team probably would not know. And also just like being his right hand sort of like if anything he needs out, I'll be able to do that for him. So that was like a really precious role. I really appreciated that. After that, after the apprentice role, I became the um I became the director of operations um because Dr. French asked me. And you know, that was a little short journey. It was like not even a month. I think it was <laughs> <laughs> 29 days it. it was like a little bit more than a month and um yeah and then it just went down but i'm not i i would at first i was upset because not with other people but i was more upset with myself because i sabotaged myself i put myself there and then i chose to be the training coordinator but i don't really mind it like being a collaborator is just as fine as being a leader on the team because yeah. it's just like such a dynamic experience with whatever role you have you can grow from it yeah you've definitely had i would say in the five years uh that i think uh, that i've been mentoring um you have had the most dynamic uh, growth out of any of the participating students. Uh, you, you went from, yeah, it's definitely a compliment. You definitely went from, uh, you said your first role was evaluations coordinator. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you filled a vacancy for a manager position in that same division. And then you became the apprentice, which, um, The apprentice is really like the executive assistant to the lead mentor. So they're, like you said, the right hand person for the lead Mm -hmm. mentor. By the way, as a side note, the apprentice position was proposed by Anthony. Um, He's currently on the team. He's a junior. And he proposed, I think, two years ago. And he was actually one of the first apprentices. And his idea Mm -hmm. of that role was it would be an assistant to the mentor. And they'd learn like the ins and outs of being like... Uh, a leader at the top, being a mentor for other people with the hopes that they would eventually become a mentor to someone in the future. Aww. So that's yeah. why Anthony created it. Yeah, that's, that's, I- I'm really thankful for Anthony for doing that. It's it's a great role. Yeah. And then after your apprentice position, you kind of got, I wouldn't say it was an upgrade or a downgrade. It was like a side grade to the director of operations. 
because mm-hmm. that that's probably the most one of the most difficult director positions for um, sure because you're not just managing your department you're managing the entire team for the most part yeah. um overseeing like operations across the entire team of like 50 plus members uh mm-hmm. and then after that you said you t- you took your fall and you <laughs> went from director to now you're the training coordinator. Yeah. So, so it was like a 360 sort of. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> do, do you want to talk about that? What's that position, training coordinator? Well, as a training coordinator, unfortunately, as a training coordinator... I was not able to do much training because, you know, the COVID stuff happened. I was I had a lot of plans for that. But as a training coordinator, you train the team to basically become more comfortable within their role. Um, I did a lot of workshops. Um, I planned a lot of workshops. I was Talk really, about some of those uh, uh, workshops that uh, were planned and, or executed like that we've had in the past. Um, one of the, um, one of the workshops where, um, the competition simulator workshop, it was like when we were getting to prepare for the competition and as the, um, before like the competition started, I wanted to prepare the rookies who didn't know much about, um, the competition, like what's going to happen and what they're going to expect and, you know, the rules and everything. I even like created this like question asking simulator and like, you know, went around, asked them random questions about the team. Mm -hmm. Most of them were not able to answer those questions, but that, that was expected. I was hoping that would be a learning experience. And what makes me proud about like, the workshop, the whole training session thing is that when I was a evaluation coordinator um, and like when I first joined, I talked to my director and they were planning on doing something for the tra- um, training um, division. And I came up with the idea of like, you know, having first training session, second training session where, you know, everyone has a way to like n- get to know the team and b- become more comfortable in their role. So that's that, that was nice. Yeah, I really like what uh, the training and recruitment and evaluations, like those teams and the recruitment division, I really like what um, has come out of that really small, sometimes overlooked division because they're in charge Mm -hmm. of uh, recruiting people, training them, and then making sure that they stay on the team through evaluations and progress reports. So I really like it. Some of the other workshops, uh, you had actually pitched a workshop before, well, well, while you were an apprentice, and I was completely on board. It was, I believe, the sexism workshop. Yes, yes. That was before you even um, were <laughs> kind of in the recruitment division. You were an apprentice yes. and you're like, oh, we really need to educate uh the team specifically the boys um Mm -hmm. about sexism so do you want to talk about that Mm -hmm. yeah sexism is a topic that as a girl like i didn't know about sexism much like i just thought it was like a norm like oh people are treating me this way oh maybe because i wasn't doing such a great job or something but sexism is some a topic that people are so unaware of but they're doing it all the time especially in the team where you know there are um the girl to boy ratio is like you know not the same Mm -hmm. so sometimes like um especially like you know um, leaders that are guys, they they tend to overpower or act a certain way that may be unaware, like, like they're not aware about it, but it's sexist. So yeah. I was yeah. really passionate about it. And the passion also started from, you know, like being an apprentice and like being around you so much because you sort of, you know, put that wisdom onto me. So the sexism workshop, it was literally the slides were done and that's the day I fell asleep. I mean, not fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> I fell sick because I was traveling a lot. That was like, that was when like, you know, coronavirus started happening and I just couldn't come to school. And little did I know that was going to be like my last day to ever come to school. Yeah. And next day I find out that, you know, schools are shut down. So that was unfortunate, but I can definitely say that that the slides I created they can be used next year if anything you know everyone 
like the guys, the rookies, everyone has learned something. Like I would definitely say that they're more ab- aware about those things, even without like the workshop that happened by being on the team. Yeah. I, um, I'm definitely a guy. Uh, I feel, and I wasn't all, always like this. I'll be honest. Um, I think I was just clouded, ignorant about my own like sexist um, ideals or mm-hmm. uh, actions sometimes, you know? So yeah. I like to say like it was after my niece was born that I started to like see things. And I was like, oh my God, people really treat girls differently. And I was not having it. And it, it made me, I guess I want to say like using my privilege as a, as a guy to kind of force change, at least within Full Metal Beavers, you know, robotics. So I made a conscientious effort to um, put girls into leadership. And when I saw some girls being kind of assigned by the by their male leaders, uh, like secretarial tasks or assistant tasks, or even though you were basically my assistant as a girl, um, there were some girls who were literally the only things that they were doing were just like, oh, take notes or clean up or do this. And I was like, no, 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 yeah. we're not mm-hmm. doing that. Um, so... That was something that I saw and I wanted to change. I wanted to like uh, change the mindset of like a lot of the boys and even some girls. Sometimes you have to like kind of snap them out of it uh, yeah. that they can do stuff that boys can do or better or they can do their own thing. They don't have to like try to be a boy, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so one of the things I know the recruitment division was doing as a active effort this year was to recruit more girls. And I think we were successful in recruiting more girls. Definitely. Yeah. Do you feel like it's difficult to get girls on a quote unquote robotics team? Yes, it, it's <laughs> difficult. Cause um, I remember we had the club fair, right. And I, me and Anindo, we were like, they are, like actively recruiting people and when people heard um robotics team only guys were coming i'm like where are the girls and Mm -hmm. that's what made like that's what makes me wish that from next time we're marketed or you know we're recruiting people by saying join the full metal beavers rather than saying join the robotics team because honestly yeah we are a robotics team but there's so much more like you're learning real world life lessons here. This is not just a robotics team. So, you know, my advice to people that are going to be in recruitment next year and everything, just, you know, talking about how robotics can change you and how the full metal beavers can change you because we're just doing way a lot of things, a lot of things here that can change a person, make them grow. What do you think is um, causing, from your opinion, what do you think is causing that, like, uh, that blockage, like, that seems to be preventing girls or discouraging girls from wanting to join, quote unquote, robotics? Do you think it's that word? Yeah, I do. I I just think it's that and, like, a lot of other um, external and internal factors. I mean... In our school, like robotics is one of the biggest teams. And now we have the girls club. We have um, we have other clubs, like big clubs that are forming slowly. And with that, like, I don't I don't like there's My no gosh. competition between the girls club and the full metal beavers. But I'm just saying like with the girls club, more girls are obviously going to join because <laughs> the, the girls club. I sound kind of dumb, but my god, um, right, 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 right. Just, like, just like you know, the reputation the word robotics has. You know, people tend to think, even I would say, some adults. Um, no offense, tend to think that you know, robotics kids are just different, and th- that's not always a positive reputation. I don't know why. Maybe because we are like when when someone joins the full metal beavers they sort of like change like to a more dynamic and like they become like more expressive about like themselves if if i don't know if i'm making sense yeah. but you know i guess we're the i don't know how to explain it loud ones but we're not loud <laughs> that in the class we in classes we definitely tend to speak more so 
just like the bad reputation sometimes robotics has. I don't know why. Maybe it's jealousy. <laughs> Who knows? Okay. I was thinking more of um, it's kind of like internalized. Uh, I guess it's like sexism. I think maybe, perhaps, when I don't know, it's it's a hard thing to talk about. Yeah, I think, like I said, you know, like I said, it, like you said, you know, internal things. When I, as a girl, first joined robotics, my parents were not on board because I was spending way too much time here. But the thing is, I was doing work. I was actually putting in work in robotics. And they were just like sort of, you know, look down upon it. Like, why are you in robotics? Why are you in robotics? Do you but- think your parents, um, they were angry that you were spending too much time? Or do you feel like, oh, you're going to go into a career path of robotics, like you're going to build robots. And that they were like, that's not the career path for you. By, I think my parents are more concerned because I, I consider myself a pretty crafty, uh, artsy person. So like when, when it came to robotics, I was doing a lot of like arts and crafts and like sort of creative thinking. And I know for sure my parents are not a big fan of that. They want me to go into the medical field, which I'm not really interested in. So when they saw me coming home and doing painting for this, painting a banner, doing this, doing that, making things, they weren't definitely a big fan of that. Oh, I see. Um, how did you get your parents to change your mind or convince them to be like this is what i want to (laughs) do or is that ongoing oh uh, it's still ongoing but their um perspective on robotics has changed like significantly i would say from the beginning because and that's all i got the posse scholarship and I, i explained to them that this is why you know having a good extracurricular experience is so important like i would say that 80% of the reason why I, you know, got the posse scholarship is because of my leadership experience in in the team. And I just told them that if it wasn't for Dr. French, if it wasn't for the team, I would probably not be able to get this scholarship. So they, they were, they were like, Oh, I see. That's why you need to, that's why you were spending this much time. Like, yes, mom, I was spending (laughs) this much time for a reason. Can you talk about posse? Like, what is that? And how did you get introduced to it? And what was the process? Let's talk about that. Yeah. Um, Posse is a nonprofit organization. It's basically a full um, tuition scholarship for student leaders all over from New York City. And there are different posses. Like I'm from the New York City Posse. There's the D.C. Posse. And you get matched with um, matched with the college of your choice um, based on the college they're partnered with um, through like various um interview processes and I would say the posse experience and like the interviews and stuff they were truly just so unique like the first one it truly like all of the all of the interviews it tested me as a person it tested me as a team worker and um you know at first um I was first in- introduced to it when um, Mr. Tai called me in his office and like he was asking me um if if he was asking me a couple of questions along with someone previously um, from like who went through the posse process to ask me a couple of questions to see if I was fit for it. And Uh um, it was Ancho. Ancho was like, yeah, you should definitely have her here. And then, you know, he signed me up. I filled out the application and turns out like you were one of the, one of the people who helped chose, um, you know, choose me for that, Mm -hmm. for the Posse scholarship. So I'm super thankful about that. The first one, the first round, it was hundred people in the same room and it was, it was hard to stand out, but the best thing, the best advice I took from you, Mr. Tai was really that just being myself. And I was myself. And what was weird that the leaders that were chosen were from the robotics team mostly. Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. But, I I am proud to say, like, I definitely um, am just overwhelmed with joy when students come into the team and they have their little experience and then they leave as leaders or some type of leadership experience. So being able to get nominated for this full tuition um, scholarship 
is great, you know? And you being able to demonstrate or communicate what you've learned from robotics to these other people and other students around uh, the city, uh, it's mm-hmm. great to share those experiences, you know? Yeah. And this this whole experience just means so much to me as a first-gen student, as a girl. I'm the first girl in my family to ever go to a college. So this is a huge That's amazing. deal. This is a huge deal for me. Super thankful about it. Do you um okay, by the way, where's Lafayette College for people that don't know? Um, Lafayette College is in Easton, Pennsylvania. Um, kind of sad about leaving, but really excited for my college experience. I mean, um, Pennsylvania, Easton especially, it's like a small suburban area. Um, it it doesn't compare to New York City, you know, but <laughs> no, nowhere compares to nowhere. New York City. Yeah. Let me tell you, when I went to college in East Lansing, Michigan, it wasn't even the capital. The capital of Michigan is Lansing and mm. Michigan State University is in East Lansing. So it's a suburb of Lansing, the capital. And I was like, okay, maybe. Um, no, it was nothing like New York, nothing. And I don't think anywhere on the, uh, planet is anywhere like New York city. Um, what are you going to study, Satuna? Well, I am undecided about that. I went and undecided. It's just because I, I don't know what really interests me, but I love science Mm -hmm. and I love, you know, I I just consider myself a people's person. And I I keep saying that, oh, maybe I want to become a teacher. Uh, Mm -hmm. But I don't know why people in my family or I've noticed that when I shared it with even the teachers in ours, they were like, really? (laughs) <laughs> they were sort of like confusing me i'm like you really sh- are you sure you want to become them like um i don't know that's why i'm more confused now <laughs> I, thought I, I thought i wanted to become a teacher and you know like because you inspired me more to become a teacher you know mm-hmm. that because of like how you treat us not as like kids you treat us like adults and mm-hmm. you hold us responsible for the things we do and mm-hmm. i think it's so important for like a like that's why I like the job of a teacher. You are impacting people directly. Yeah. And that's exactly what I, what I want to do. Like, I want to help people. I don't want to become a doctor. Excuse me now. But <laughs> you feel like doctors don't help people? <laughs> no, they do. But it's just like not me. Like, it's not me. <laughs> but I want to like, like, um, sort of merge my creative side and my side where I want to help people together. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> do you um do you feel like you were more confident about what you wanted to be or where you saw yourself in the future before joining robotics? Um I, I'm not understanding that question. So you just said you wanted to be a teacher. Um, yeah. or you think you want to be a teacher. Were you more uh-huh. confident about being a teacher before joining robotics or was that after? Did robotics well, kind of like mess you up and be like, now I don't know what I want to be? Um, to be honest, robotics did sort of mess me up about uh-huh. like me wanting to be a teacher because uh-huh. when I came into this team, oh my God, all these roles, like, yeah, as, as a leader, like I'm looking after the entire team sort of and like business, engineering. And I, I, I know that engineering is sort of not possible by me or it's like i i haven't like like i'm not interested in engineering but business i'm super interested like Mm -hmm. graphic designing marketing i'm like i feel like i can do that i can be an entrepreneur um and the teaching aspect like sort of became vague it's still an interest but became vague because i realized that maybe i like consulting with people i Mm -hmm. like you know leading people i i want to be a leader in the future too i want to be like a boss woman and you know like you know what i mean yeah i I just don't want to be stuck in the same place yeah but also impact people yeah (laughs) i think something that could be a a, a pop a great selling point for like our organization, Full Metal Beavers, is that we have such a wealth of roles and positions uh, for everyone. Yes. You know, we, def- we definitely don't have a teacher position that's not available. But I guess a training coordinator is like a teacher because you're holding yeah. workshops, you're teaching, you're mm-hmm. educating um, the current members, 
and new members mm -hmm. about things. So it's great. And then like you mentioned, we have like graphic design and business. Uh, a lot of the things that started this year from the business department, those are like entrepreneurial skills, you know, exactly. uh, releasing yes. products, merchandise, launching a Patreon page, just like managing this social media. That is a whole job that people are getting um, six figures paid to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so okay. it's, it's great. I, I think that's a, a great selling point because just the, the wealth of opportunities it might be overwhelming for some new members. Like I uh, imagine you're really young, you're a ninth grader and you're on the application page and you're like, oh, which position do you want to get into? That's why we don't list the positions. We list uh, like vague things that you're interested in. Oh, I'm interested in programming. I'm interested in designing. I'm interested in like managing people, you know? Yeah. I just want to say that how much I love the interview process. You know, I, f I think we're the only club or team in our school that sort of interviews people to get in. And I understand it can be so intimidating, but <laughs> just seeing how the rookies grow from their interview process to now, I like based on like, I did so many interviews and when I compare them from before to now, I'm just like, wow, look at you. You were shaking in that interview. Look at yeah. you now. Yeah so much confidence uh, a lot mm -hmm. of members have gained just from being like within let's say like the first three or four months of yeah. being with the team I will say I used to, I, I don't say it so often anymore but I used to say uh, there was an inter there was a member his name was Moffler he was one of the managers for the engineering department and he was one of the most intimidating interviewers because at the mm -hmm. time we only had leaders interviewing new members only the leaders mm -hmm. were interviewing. And mm -hmm. I told him, I said, if I was a student and I was interviewing to be part of this team, I don't think I would get in because I'd be so nervous based on how yeah. he was interviewing. Uh, talk about how your interview went, if you remember. Um, yeah, I remember. Yeah, my interview was also done by leaders. I was scared. I was really scared. <laughs> I definitely thought I, I was going to get rejected, but I didn't. Um, it was intimidating. They were asking me questions and like they were serious. Like, where are the smiles? It's like, hi. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't feeling welcome. Like, did I make the wrong choice by applying here? This is really scary. And I just like, I went home and I kept doubting myself that I probably don't belong, belong in this team and stuff. Uh -huh. But the interview process, they asked me so many things about, they got to know me more like how I work as a team. What does a team mean to me? Mm -hmm. Am I an organized person? And I was trying to be honest. And many of the questions, one of them was like, are you an organized person? I was just like, um, no, I'm not organized. And Anisha, who was a director, was like, okay. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> damn, that's it. I'm I'm not joining this it's team. But, but here I am, you know. <laughs> um, why do you think we have that interview process? I mean, you know the answer, but uh, maybe you want to explain it. Well, you know, when... Our when we're interviewing someone, we're not trying to reject them. We're this is the interviews are also being documented as like we're interviewing someone. It's just to see the progress of a person, like I mentioned, like from personal point of view, and also just seeing that, also helping that person find the role that best will benefit them. Mm -hmm. We're not trying to assign them a role by saying, oh here's your interview we're going to put you in the engineering department mm -hmm. but you don't know anything about engineering so if you're in your interview if you're saying something like oh yeah i love talking to people oh um i consider myself a person who is very um um loud in classes we're gonna match you to a match you to a role that's gonna fit you fit yeah. those cat fit for your traits so that i think that's super impressive and it, it's the right thing to do yeah. One of the things uh, when I think it was two years ago when we set up the precedent for like we changed the interviewing uh, process, the whole recruitment process, because before there were like applications, uh, like paper mm -hmm. applications, and then you submit yeah. it and you automatically get in. And then we decided, OK, we need an interview because we need to know where these and they could elect to. Um, the applicants could elect where they wanted to go. And we had an mm -hmm. overabundance of people in 
engineering. Oh, no, engineering. in engineering, because people wanted oh, wow. to build the robot. And that became such a disaster because we can't have 50 people building the robot, you know? Because mm-hmm. what is everyone else going to like? How, how do we have like a logo or how do we get T-shirts or how do we organize buses or what do we plan for these? So we needed to figure out a way how to change that process. So we talked about the interview process and we framed it as just like what you said, we're not trying to reject people, even though some people do get rejected. Uh, yes. For the most part, the people that get rejected are the ones that don't show up to the interview. Yeah. Um, but the yeah like you said we don't want to reject people what we're trying to do is trying to find out what they're good at where would they best fit in the team so we actually would love if we had a hundred members or 200 members we just need to know what everyone's good at so we could put them in the team because ultimately uh i think being on this team or any uh, team that's like run like a business or an organization is difficult, you know, and you're going to run into uh, challenges and you're going to run into struggles and we don't want to kick people off the team. We want to make sure that they're put into a position where they can uh, thrive and flourish and grow. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Let me ask you this question, Satuna. What has been your legacy on the team? Like when you graduate in a few months and let's say five years from now or 10 years from now, uh, when you look back on the team or you come back and visit, you're like, hey, I did this or I was the one that implemented this. What do you think your legacy is or is going to be? Yeah, being part of the team for like, you know, one and a half year but like I have had so many experiences there have been so many things that I have done I can't name them all but the most important thing that like I'm so proud of is the core values Mm -hmm. me and Freddie when we were applying for the um, NASA grant this year one of the questions were like what does your team value the most and tell us about your team and the core values came up and i remember in the leadership chat dr french you were asking us that you know what does our team value the most and those things equity opportunity and unity it was put into the nasa grant and we got the nasa grant and just knowing that it's such a good marketing thing and it's truly the things that we value and yeah. I, I i can look back at it and i don't think that these values are going to change i mean equity the most unity we're a team and opportunity like those three things i don't think those values are ever going to change it's it's it makes me really proud so yeah. i'm definitely be looking back at it i'm like wow this happened by myself and Freddie. So yeah. really proud of that. I'm really proud of you and Freddie. And I'm, I'm just really proud of you guys for coming up with those terms and cementing those as core values. Because uh, having values and being able to um, embed those values in all of our decision making and transferring them to our members. And now it's to the point like you can ask our members what are our core values and they will tell us. And they're they're gonna scream it. Yeah, yes. scream it out. Uh huh. Yeah. It's it's great. I, I love it. Um yeah. let's talk about those core values, Satuna. What what do those values mean to you? Like you said, like the core values are super personal to me because they align with my um, identity, you know, especially equity. I that word, I didn't even know what it meant. I feel like that one for that core value, you you came up with it and you helped us with it. Equity is a thing where people confuse it. People think it's equality and people always talk about equality. But equity is providing people with the assistance they need because they don't they're not privileged enough or they don't have enough Mm -hmm. so that's what the team really does if someone's really falling behind or someone's not doing like they're not doing well as a person mentally or in their role there's going to be additional assistance provided to you. So me as, as a girl, you know, being from the LGBTQ community and, you know, just first gen immigrant, all those stuff, really, equity means a lot to me. And equity was provided to me when, you know, I became a leader in this team. So there weren't a lot of girl leaders in our team. So, yeah, it's it's awesome. I think um, your 
your trajectory on the team and also just your uh, your eventual end goal with Posse and getting into this college and leaving New York and being able to just open up your perspective and your your opportunities, those core values really align to that pathway that you've taken. Like the equity that you are just as good as someone else and you were provided this opportunity with Posse and mm-hmm. now you're like united with, you have your own little Posse actually. Like yeah, you called it like the New York Posse. Uh-huh. And it's, you, it's you, like... I'm sorry, yeah. No, no, you can go. <laughs> I was going to say that you you meet with those uh, people virtually now, but you meet with those um, other posse scholars. How many are there? Um, Well, in Lafayette, um, on campus, there are 80 as a whole, but each year there are Two, um, 10 people coming from New York City and 10 people coming from D.C. Mm-hmm. So 20, 20 posse students each year. Um, but I was just going to say that, you know, posse, I remember in that interview, they asked us what teamwork meant and you know, all those stuff. And if I wasn't on this team, I would say different things or like, you know, how to, how to act in a team. Like when you're in that setting with like 100 people in that interview, the first dab, it was like people did things that to stand out but you don't want to like overpower yourself and being part of this team it taught me that and i feel like that's how i went through all those steps and just when you just, say <laughs> overpower yourself what do you what do you mean by that like um when like when you're trying to strive for something and there are so many people there's more competition so people are gonna you know show off a little bit you know do oh, more than see, they're needed yeah and the third round, um, I was I was just talking about my experience and and what made me a little bit upset was that after I got chosen, my trainer told me that I was trying too hard, and that that hurt a little bit. I told you this, Doctor French. Oh yeah, you were aligning you were aligning this with sexism, and when yeah. I think about it, yes, because I was when, angry when you told me that he said that. Yeah, I was angry. I was crying to you. <laughs> yeah, and I was I remember, angry. <laughs> ugh, it it made me really upset because, of course, I'm going to be trying. And now that I think back at it, I was there were only two girls from my circle in my third round. And the girl that was with me, she didn't get posse. I was the only one who did. Damn. So that that that. You know, something to reflect on. <laughs> Some, definitely something to, to reflect on. Um, if, you're, if your trainer is listening to this podcast, what would you say to him? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I, I don't think, I mean, I just want to say that, of course, I was trying hard. What do you mean? <laughs> uh, what do you mean, girl? This is a $200,000 scholarship. <laughs> you think you, oh, no. Yeah, I had to. Of course, I was trying hard. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> yeah, I that I remember when you called me and you told me that I was so angry. I was angry for you. I mean, you were upset, but I was angry. I was like, "What? How could he say like you're trying to?" Duh. Duh. <laughs> uh, duh. But no. But the way uh, I guess he framed it was in this negative way, and I I put it in that frame of like, uh. A lot of times when women, uh, girls, females, when they are, quote unquote, trying too hard or they overachieve, quote unquote, they're named as like bees or cutthroat or um, like reaching beyond like what they're – I don't know. Whatever sexist people say, that's what they (laughs) say, you know? And Mm -hmm. it's upsetting because if it were a guy, it's just like, oh, it's a guy being a guy or, oh, yes, he's competitive, you know? And it's just like, that's really messed up. It is. It is. So I've just, I've never, um, I mean, thankfully, I've never experienced that where someone has said that to me. But I imagine if I was a girl or if I witnessed that, I'd be outraged because that's ridiculous. Yeah, for sure. Um, So let's talk about your expectations for leaving uh, high school, 
eventually becoming an alumni for both Jamaica Gateway to the Sciences and Full Metal Beavers. What are your expectations going into college? Like, what do you think is is in store for you? College. Uh, this is I've I've dreamed of this. You know, going away for college. I didn't think it was possible until you know I got posse where I was sort of bound to you know go to Lafayette because it was a binded decision. Um, but all I can say is that when I go to college, I just cannot wait to express myself because, um, because like at home, I'm, I can't really express myself to the full extent because mind this, I am, I am growing up in a brown household and, you know, there are a lot of things aligned to me that where I can't sit this certain way i can't eat this certain way i can't wear this i can't wear that i can't talk like this so all of the thing all those things are like sort of restraining me from being myself so when you say a brown house household uh, do you feel comfortable clarifying that well if you are not I, I think people that are from a brown house would understand this but the brown community sort of like they see community girls are marginalized so much i mean it, it's pretty bad and um I'm, I'm just i'm but i'm really thankful that i'm at least in america where i know about these things if i was still in bangladesh i would not even know i would think of this as a norm just someone telling me that oh you're supposed to eat like this that's sexist and I, i'm told <laughs> that i'm told that i'm supposed to eat a certain way or talk a certain way yeah. in college i will have that and i can be myself that's what i'm looking the most forward to like for me school spe- spe- um, especially room 106 you know your room was my safe space and uh, where i could be myself i think college is also hopefully going to be my safe space but mm-hmm. yeah what do you um uh, this is kind of off topic. It gets into a whole different discussion. <laughs> Do you think so? You, when you say brown household, uh, you're talking about um, uh, the Bangladeshi like culture, or you're talking about the Muslim culture. You're talking about that region in Asia, like the South Asian. It's a combination of everything. By by a brown household, I really mean like the Desi community, like the region in South um, um, Asia, like Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, um, Nepal, that stuff. And when you're part of those countries, there are the, the culture of it. The culture itself is sexist. I'm not trying to say that maybe um, my religion tries to you know marginalize women because it doesn't, but... I'm just saying that the culture of those countries are like sort of shaped in order to like oppress women. But in America, p- women are much more freer, but that doesn't mean they they're like free from sexism. Yeah. Uh, I, I, we both watch the same show and yes. um, we're talking about RuPaul's Drag Race. And on one of the episodes, it was like a musical episode and they talked about um, in one of the lyrics, it said a man will make a dollar and a woman will only make 80 cents for every dollar that a man makes, which is so messed up. So you, when oh. you're talking about like the culture in these other countries and in the United States, this country, um, women definitely have more opportunities or there may be more freedoms compared to other women in other countries uh, on the planet. Uh, there's still this disparity in wages and other things like rights so it's it's messed up it's so messed up and that's just like all the all these things and like people like you motivating me and like the show the rupaul's drag race like it has changed me as a person shows like that that sort of like makes me want to like change the world i know it's like a very you know uh, overachieving like <laughs> I, I can't change the world by myself, but I can do certain things that can help change the world in, in little ways. Yeah. Like if I can just like help the Eastern community in college, just like help the Eastern community understand more about sexism and like help, you know, you know, merge the wage gap, like like cancel the wage gap, that itself is such would be such a huge accomplishment accomplishment for me. 
You hear that, me. Twitter? Hashtag cancel the wage gap. Period. Um, did you... I just have this question. Did you, did you watch RuPaul's Drag Race before meeting me? So... <laughs> or what? did I corrupt you with that, too? <laughs> <laughs> you... I just want to be you, Dr. <laughs> I think I asked you for my um, resume. When I asked you for my resume for college, I said, you're protege. I don't even know. Yeah, how protege. Know. Yeah. No, you know I what's crazy? I did not know what that word meant. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I was so flattered that you wanted to be like my apprentice and my protege. And I remember having like a very serious conversation with you. I said, I'm flattered. I love that you are learning all these things from me. I And I even like... Uh, borderline pleaded with you saying I really wish you could have a female role model I I love being a role yes. model for for people yes, yes, yes um and I find it so maybe it's just my own insecurities that I need to get past but I find it so uh peculiar and I don't know why I find it peculiar but I find it peculiar when uh girls because there's other girls on the team that have told me like they look up to me oh they want to be like it, it, the idea of having a male role model for and you're the opposite gender or a different gender it's just it's um it's different to me so i'm just like okay so i don't know <laughs> I, I really don't even know how to respond to that um it's well, crazy. I understand. I understand that, like, you know, it can be overwhelming for you, but it's true. All of us love you so much. But, like, if I was going to talk about RuPaul's Drag Race, I used to see so many memes on social media. I'm like, who are these people? I thought they were women, uh-huh. first of all, these drag queens. I did not have any idea about drag queens. And I started watching, like, I was like, what? These memes are kind of spicy. These are like funny. Let me let me watch the show. And like when I when I sort of like came in terms with my identity as a um as being part of the LGBTQ plus community, I was like, I need to watch this show. And I watched it and you know, you um made me listen to this song by RuPaul. I'm like, what? Oh my god. <laughs> Like, this is empowering oh as hell. And I could not stop listening to it. I could not stop listening to it. <laughs> uh, what was the name of that song? Is it is it PG? Is it clean? Um, Definitely not. <laughs> oh, my God. But you should definitely oh. listen to I mean, whoever's listening to this, please listen to it. It's Catitude by um, Miley Cyrus um, featuring RuPaul. But RuPaul's <laughs> other songs are just, like, so empowering. Oh, oh my goodness. Oh my I okay, so I have a lot of questions. Um one thing I want to say just regarding RuPaul is I remember when I was younger, my parents had opinions about RuPaul. They said some really bad things. And I didn't understand like what they meant, but I just believed them because they're my parents. I was like, okay, yeah, sure, whatever. Uh and just like everyone grows up, they grow up in like with these racist ideals, these sexist ideals, these like homophobic, transphobic, fatphobic, like every type of um marginalization that you could have for a difference or people that are not like um that don't fit into that beautiful nice like societal mold uh you're just like grown up in that so watching rupaul's drag race there's like a thousand seasons of of this show but watching (laughs) this show uh has actually made me kind of learn about some of the homophobic ideologies I have or the transphobic ideologies. So just like, it's very educational, I, I would say. Very, very. Um, I have changed so much from being in robotics and like, you know, being around you. At first, I, I talk about you a lot in at, in, at home. It's because I'm like, oh my God, Dr. French is going to write me a recommendation. Oh my God, Dr. French told me this. He told me to be, you know, like love myself, all this stuff. I'm like, my mom's like, you know, we tell you to love yourself too. (laughs) But Dr. French told me to love myself. That was an actual conversation. Like that was an actual conversation. (laughs) And (laughs) I just, I just like, I'm just thinking like, being part of this podcast is just making me realize how much you have impacted me. And for me, it's like all positive, all yeah. positive. 
I Thank definitely you. oh you're you're welcome. But I wanted to say that you had like that um well we call it like bad B energy, you know? Like you have that. It's uh, I don't know, like, if my part to play in it was basically, like, kind of removing some of the dirt and junk that was preventing it from shining through. So, I think that's really what it is. You have it, and I think everyone has it. Everyone has uh, the ability to be, like, super confident. And there's nothing wrong with confidence. Confidence is a great quality to have. It improves everything, you know? So if you have confidence, you can walk into a room, make friends, start a conversation. You know how to handle a lot of situations. And I don't think that I somehow impart confidence on someone. I think it's really just me assisting, maybe holding their hand a little bit in um, discovering that secret superhero. The the secret is that we did osmosis, and that's just like our secret <laughs> handshake, sort of. And that's how you transfer the bad B energy. <laughs> I remember, Period. I remember sometimes um, I'll I'll do that little osmosis thing with like you, and I remember Bushra needed some confidence too. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. interesting. Let's go back onto that like sexism talk. Do you feel like girls need more confidence than boys? Or do you think it's equal, or do you think boys need more confidence? What's your opinion? See, this is it depends on the person. Mm-hmm. But girls, I I don't think girls need. They should be who they are. It's just sometimes like, but it's like society, like like I said, like society, like correlating all these stereotypes with women, and that that sort of like pushes them to like not be the best version of themselves, or like you know, sort of like making them. F- go into like this i don't know like like sort of shrinking themselves if you know what i mean um and like when you are confident as a woman in the society people are calling you people are calling you like loud annoying who does she think she is yeah and it has yeah. happened with me but if i'm like shrinking myself somewhere away and they're like oh my gosh she's too sensitive so as girls there's like like there's no fine line where we can be that's good, not going to make us ma- make the society not think of us a certain way. They're always going to have comments. So it's just, my my advice is just be you, whatever makes you feel comfortable. And that's advice to myself. Like, and I have been practicing that. Like being in quarantine, I talk to myself a lot. I'm not crazy. I promise. <laughs> I, I have changed. I have changed. I promise. Oh my god. Um. You said that you wanted to change people, like improve them, make them better, kind of mentor them. Do you think you're going to try to do that in college? Like, how how do you think you're going to be empowering girls or people uh, in college? Like, kind of paying it forward. Mm-hmm. I I remember we had a conversation. And I was telling you that I want to impact people. I want to change people that and you told me that you can't change some that's completely up to them Mm -hmm. but my now that i think about it i don't necessarily want like i don't want to like do certain things that's gonna like you know change them and like you know force them to change that's completely up to them but i want to like my plan for you know going to lafayette is like forming these um sort of clubs or anything that's gonna make like that's gonna promote like individuality and promote like you know confidence and you know their place as a woman in society and how they can do more they can always do more and just strive you know yeah that that that's my goal when i go to college i i hopefully if i'm i hopefully if i succeed i just want to like you know like make a community of like girls that are willing to do the same and sort of, you know, pass that energy on, you know, like do osmosis with them too. Yeah. yeah. And it doesn't have to be girls or boys. It can be anybody. It's, yeah. it, you know, that's, I was just thinking, I was having like one of my little flash forward future telling moments. Um, I was thinking about something you just said, uh, like a few minutes ago saying that, Society will always have some opinion about you, and you is in the plural, like anyone. And so when there are women, girls, 
who are confident and I don't know, fighting for rights or being activist or loud or whatever you want to call it. Um, people are threatened by that. People what are. What would you say to someone who's like, why are these girls acting like that? Like, okay, let, let's say, let's, let's make it physical. There was, there was a women's march that happened shortly after the inauguration of um, President Trump. And there were <laughs> women wearing hats in the shape of uh, pink vaginas. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> there were some people that were like, why are they wearing these things? Oh my God, why are they wearing vaginas on their head? What would you say to those people? Like those they need to... They need to, th the problem is they're ignorant and they need to educate themselves. Trust me, I have been, I have, me as a girl, I've been like this too. Like, um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this word, but can you just like put a beep on it? Like, <laughs> like, no, don't, have, don't okay, say fine. it. All right, don't I have it. used derogatory terms towards other girls when they're like expressive of them of themselves. And now when I have gotten, like you have, told me so many things by watching drag race reading books and all those like just school itself and all the knowledge yeah it has yeah. changed me that girls need to do this they they have been oppressed from the beginning of time and if guys were doing this it would be funny this this would be something on on like social media becoming a meme as something really funny oh my god blah blah, blah. but when when girls are doing this oh it's disgusting so I would tell them to like, you know, you need to educate yourself in these topics and know where they're coming from. Yeah. Because yeah. this is not fun or this is not something that's supposed to be funny. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Uh, what is your biggest takeaway from being part of Full Metal Beavers? <clears throat> biggest Tough takeaway. Tough question. Very tough question. Um, so this is, you know, cliche, but the biggest takeaway is you gotta love yourself before you love someone else. Like RuPaul said, you need to love yourself. And it, it can be really, really hard. And sometimes people people can support you into like, you know, loving yourself. But when you like believe in yourself and when you when you love yourself enough to just be like, oh yeah, you can do this. You're here for a reason. That's when you're going to really just, you know, go up, 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 up. Like, and you know, your inner saboteur, you know, I'm using all these drag race terms that I learned from you. Um, just these things can really impact you and, you know, make you feel like you're not enough, but being part of full metal beavers and just like, even if it's something normal, like, or something small, like, Oh, I, I have to raise my hand and talk during a meeting. You like, if you love yourself, you're going to have that confidence to like, you know, stand up and talk. I know like so many rookies or like team members sometimes they're like, oh, I didn't raise my hand because I didn't feel like, I don't know what people are going to think. My answer was probably wrong, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. But just that, like, yeah, love yourself. Very cliche, but it's very fundamental. It's true. Something that I, um, my mother taught me, it's a similar motto to what RuPaul says, what you're talking about, RuPaul. Uh, she, and this is, this said to anyone going on a flight, like when those oxygen masks come down, if there's like a pressure change in the cabin and on an airplane, uh, you're supposed to put the mask on yourself first before anyone else. Even if you have a child or a baby, you're supposed to put it yeah. on yourself first before putting it on your child. So, I was told that when I was younger, I used to fly on planes, like I used to travel with my mother. So uh, that was something that resonated with me in that you have to take care of yourself first before you can take care of someone else. RuPaul says, um, how in the hell are you going to love somebody else if you can't love yourself, you know? So Can I get an amen up in here? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Amen. <laughs> so that's what RuPaul says. That's what he says. And um it reminded me of what my mother uh used to tell me so 
that's just something that I always have to r- remind myself. It's a grounding technique. Sometimes I have to uh, like kind of slap myself with. And if I'm putting too much energy into, let's say, one of you guys uh, who might be not having a good day or not a good month, you might the whole month you might be like really sad. I have to remember, okay. Let me not put too much energy into this one person. And remember, like, they will be okay. You know, if I've done my job as a mentor, they will be fine in uh, discovering their inner strength and solving their own issues. So it's an important uh, life lesson. And I hope everyone that is part of Full Model Beavers, that's something that they pay forward. You know, as long as they, they have, they, uh, they survive their their tenure, their um their time on the team. If you get kicked out of the team, you haven't learned that. You know, if you're terminated prematurely or you quit, you're you're not getting that message. <laughs> yeah. So, Satuna, so uh, I know we're in this quarantine. How have you been keeping yourself sane? You said you've been talking to yourself. Huh, yeah, that's you know I talk to myself. I'd be doing that in class. Too. <laughs> before the quarantine yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that's never gonna stop but like you know i i know i'm bringing drag race a lot but i'm just saying but and i also mentioned how you know bring being in a brown household those two things um yeah free being in a brown household it's it's not it during this quarantine okay because <laughs> it, it's just not it so <laughs> i am here I like at school I have room 106 to go to for my safe space I have doctor friends to talk to my friends to talk to here I don't really have my parents that I can like like go to for emotional support so I have to be in front of my computer screen and like you know hide it from my parents the fact that I'm like watching drag race Mm -hmm. like it's those drag queens and like the advice that I'm getting from like I just need something to motivate me and tell me not to give up or like you know that you are enough like that's what I'm getting from drag race and that's how how I have been spending my time during this quarantine and also just like you know making a lot of tiktoks Mm -hmm. and just um like also um I haven't gotten the time to like you know order new paints or anything but one way I express my like art side is like through makeup so i just sit at home do like do like different looks and just take pictures and yeah <laughs> that's how i spend my time Ooh, maybe we should do some uh makeup tutorials for patreon Ooh, that that's a good be... idea yeah <laughs> um okay so tuna is there anything you would like to say to our listeners about anything before we close out um I just want to say that your inner saboteur can, will affect you, will try to tell you certain things, but you, this is what I have learned by watching Drag Race again, and this this is a really good advice, name your inner saboteur, and sometimes when it's telling you certain things, you need to tell that inner saboteur, just not, like, you're not needed right now, like, this is what I learned from Katya. Like, I don't. Do you remember that episode in All Stars, Doctor Fan? <laughs> I remember Katya, and like you say, uh, you. I think Katya's um, interceptor was Fred or something or Bill. It's anxiety, or something. Like, no, it's Brenda. Her Brenda. Yeah. Her inner saboteur was named brenda and that advice this is what i'm using right now like i I just sometimes i feel like so crappy and just feel like oh i don't feel like doing this um or like oh i'm not pretty blah 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 and i'm like you know what you're not really needed right now brenda please just please stop i don't need you right now and you know you (laughs) that that, i sound like a crazy person (laughs) shut up brenda no you shut up shut up brenda (laughs) exactly (laughs) Brenda be like doing too much sometimes, but she's not here right now. I think that's great advice, actually. Uh, it definitely sounds um, crazy, but being able to uh, call out those inner thoughts and saying, shut up, have a seat, sit down, you're canceled, 
whatever, whatever, whatever is necessary for people to overcome and be the better versions of themselves uh, is necessary. That's great. As long as it's not harming anyone, exactly. I think that's great. Yeah. Satuna, thank you so much for sitting down with me virtually, remotely to deliver episode three of our <laughs> Full Metal Beavers patron podcast. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Dr. French, for your time. I I will forever cherish this. And thank you. Just Just stay safe and take care. Okay, awesome. All right, until next time, bye. Bye.